In your final project, you need to describe the morphology of your language. This is a very common problem. When people want to document a language, they need to write a grammatical description of how that language works. In order to do this, people use a tool called interlinear glossing. In interlinear glossing, you have three elements. First, a description of what the language sounds like. For example, these are words from ancient Coptic, and you can see that their sound is Second, you have a line that tells you the meaning of each of the morphemes in the words. And third, you have a line that tells you the translation of the whole sentence. Verily, their teeth almost touched my feet. Because of this glossing, you can know that this third word, tajenaurete, has three morphemes. The first one, taje, means touch. The second one, na, is the possessive plural of the first person singular, my. And orete means feet. Touched my feet. So, again, we call this kind of uh, transcription interlinear glossing. Let's look at an example from Vietnamese. First, we have a sentence in Vietnamese. It can be, as you can see, this is just regular Vietnamese writing. And it would sound something like this. Hôm qua, lúc tôi gõ cua, thì họ dã ăn cơm xong rồi. Second, you have the meaning of each word. Really, the meaning of each morpheme. So, for example, we know that ho means they, da means the past tense, and an means eat. And we know this because they are aligned. Third, we have the meaning of the entire sentence. Yesterday, when I knocked at the door, they had already finished their dinner. So these three components are the parts of an interlinear gloss. Let's look at some more examples. This is from a Facebook account called Kittens and Linguistic Diversity. It's really good because it gets uh, examples from grammars from languages around the world and combines them with an appropriate cat picture, as in, I do not know how to build, for I have never built a building, which is a sentence from a grammar of Aramaic. As you can see, the first sentence is the words in Aramaic transcribed into English letters, and this would be in a form that researchers of Aramaic would understand. The second line has the meaning of each of the morphemes in the words. And the third line has the translation of the sentences into English, or whichever language we have in common. This is another example from the language Marquesan in, from the South Pacific. As you can see first, you have the words in Marquesan. Uh, for example, itopato poea. Poea means handsome. Second, you have the meaning of the morphemes in each of the words. And third, you have the translation of all of the sentence into English, for example. You said your handsomeness has not vanished because you went with the monsters to make a tour around the country. What happens if you have a different writing system in your language, something that is not written with Latin letters? It's really your choice. You can use a transcription that everyone will understand, like in Aramaic, of course, everyone in the discipline, or you can also include the original writing here, in this example from a grammar of ancient Egyptian, we first have the words in the ancient Egyptian writing system. Then we have a transcription form that would be understood by Egyptologists. Third, we have the translation of the morphemes in the, each of the words, and they're aligned. And finally, we have a translation in English for the whole sentence. Go get him for me. So how uh, do different types of languages work? If you have an isolating language like Vietnamese, like Mandarin, or like Thai, the glossing is very simple, very straightforward. Each of the words is going to contain one morpheme. And so this, the, this morpheme meaning line is just going to be the meaning of that one morpheme. So for example, in Mandarin, I go have China. This uh, word here, Chu is just uh, the root of the verb to go. So we only need to, uh, to have that. This sentence means I have traveled to China. In Thai, this sentence. Hmm? 
He bought three books, has the words he buy book three, and then the classifier for, for tomes, for books. So three book-shaped things. He bought three books. And each of the words has a single morpheme. So we just align them between the word and their meaning. Help. By the way, again, if you desire, you also want, you, you also can um, use the transcription in the original writing system. As long as you, you're sure that the other person, that your readers are going to understand what you're writing. You always need to include some way that gives your readers a good idea of what the words should sound like, be it IPA or some transcription system like Chinese Pinyin. For agglutinative languages, we separate the morphemes with dashes so that we know what each of the morphemes means. For example, this is a single word in Turkish, evinizdeyim. It, the whole word means I'm at your house. And the word has four morphemes. Ev is the root, it means house. Then several suffixes. Inis means your. De means at. And yim means I am. Uh, essentially the same as me. So house your at I. I'm at your house. And we can clearly see what each of the morphemes mean because they're all separated with a dash in the, both in the first line and in the second line. In fusional languages, we would do the same thing. We separate morphemes with dashes. For example, in English, the word cats contains two morphemes, the root cat and the s, which is the plural morpheme. And of course, this structure means cats. If, if it's a language, if, if you're documenting the same language you're writing in, if it's a document uh, for English grammar, you don't need to translate it. We all know that cats means uh, what cat mean, cats means. What we need is a description of what each of the morphemes mean. Cat, plural. However, fusional languages have another challenge. In fusional languages, one morpheme can pack many different units of meaning in it. For example, in Spanish, the word comi has two morphemes. The root com, which means eat, and the suffix e, which is the first person, singular, the past tense, the perfect aspect, and the indicative mood, all of these packed into that, that one morpheme. So because one morpheme can have more than one meaning unit, we separate those meaning units with a dot. So E means the first person singular, and also the past, and also the perfect, and also the indicative. So we use these dots for all of the meanings within a single morpheme. Many languages do this. In Latin, for example, the word insularum means of the islands. And it has two morphemes, the root insul, island, and the suffix arum, which is the genitive plural of the plural of island, of the islands. By the way, the system uh, can be used both for inflectional and derivational morphemes. So. This, this is an example from French. Marie relit le livre. Marie reads the book again. And you can see how, for example, in the word relit, you have a derivational prefix, re, which means again, then the root li, which is read, and then the t, which is the conjugation for the third person singular, she, and the present tense. Reads it now. Just one final example. This is a sentence from the language Udihe, which is a Tungusic language spoken in Russia. Tigers and cats were friends a long time ago. Kuti ke gezi anana aya bisiti. So this word kuti is just has just one morpheme, it's the root tiger. The word anana has just one morpheme. So it and it means long ago. Notice how we have a dot here because this is just a this is just two meanings of the translation, but they are contained a, within a single morpheme of Udihe. The word Aya means good, and the verb Bisiti has three morphemes. The root to be, the suffix for the past tense, and the suffix T, which is the third person plural. So this whole word means they were. And the sentence essentially means tigers, they were, good, long ago, 
with cats. The instrumental means that you're doing something with some somebody else. That's how glossing works. I um, I encourage you to go visit this webpage, which is the Leipzig Glossing Rules, which is the set of instructions that we're going to follow to document languages. In, and it's also very useful to get ideas of how different languages work. In summary, we use interlinear glossing to describe the morphemes in a sentence. And it has three main components. The language, so that the audience knows what it sounds like. It can be the orthography of the language, it can be IPA. The second line is the meaning of each of the morphemes. Sep uh, the morphemes are separated by dashes, and the meanings within a single morpheme are separated by dots. And then the third line has the meaning of the whole phrase or structure. And this system is called the Leipzig Glossing Rules.